that's the way of Zoom these days. So uh, we hope you had a great break. Uh, I am going to actually be uh, heading out shortly before three uh, because I have another work commitment. Uh, so I'm going to leave you in the able hands of uh, my colleague, Dean Melway, after this presentation to take you through the rest of the day. Uh, I know I'm going to be availing myself of the recordings so that I don't miss out. I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what everyone gets up to for the rest of the day. Uh, I want to say thank you to the presenters, the organizers and the participants. I felt really uh, privileged to be able to spend time here with you today and engage in this learning. I learned a lot today. So now we get to go on to our next presentation, which we are thrilled to uh, let you know about. Um, it's uh, approach to state-of-the-art customized assistive technology, the Tetra way. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for this presentation um, and the lead of the Ottawa chapter of the Tetra Society, Zara Mohammed. So Zara, I welcome you here. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation today and wish you a great afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen first. Let's see. Okay. Hi everyone and uh, welcome to our talk today. So just quickly, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, how I look visually is I'm a woman just crossed over into my 30s. My background is Middle Eastern. Uh, my complexion is pale. I have uh, dark eyes and I currently wear a hijab. Um, so going into our talk, um, so welcome to the approach to the state of the art customized assistive technology, the Tetra way. So I'm super excited for this talk because it's not just about what Tetra does um, and providing high level examples of completed projects and solutions, but uh, we will be diving way deeper into that today. And so as Tara said, I'm uh, also your mediator for this session. And uh, I am currently the Ottawa chapter Tetra lead, as well as I've been in engineering for a while and um, currently working in process engineering at Canada Post. So um, I'm joined by today, uh, I guess I'll call them my Tetra colleagues, but um, Tetra is completely volunteer run. So everyone you see here kind of on the screen and who will talk later today has their own full-time professions. Um, so in regards to the session overall, just so as we're talking through and kind of the topics we talk about, uh, so you're not kind of misled and kind of giving you an overview of what we're going to talk about. So I will start off first with a brief overview of Tetra and the assistive tech space and kind of what avenues does Tetra take on to provide what is currently not a variable currently in the market. So kind of why does Tetra exist and why does it need to exist currently? Um, next up, Natalie Tambe, who is a professional designer with 22 years of experience, currently teaching in the School of Industrial Design. Um, she will go on into detail regarding design principles and methods taken while designing for people with disabilities. Um, so generally speaking, this space itself has not been um, completely covered and continuous learning is still being applied. Following Scott Bulbrook, who will take on the next uh, topic, a technical innovator, um, successful businessman and founder of DA Integrated. Scott brings in over 30 years of experience in the semiconductor industry. And uh, I like to call him a seasoned Tetra volunteer. He's been with Tetra for a while and has come up with so many amazing solutions. Um, he will go into detail the design approaches and iterative steps taken for several projects he's completed in the recreational and daily living space. And basically talking about the design principles and kind of design aspect that Natalie has touched based on. And lastly, Dominic Peters, who currently works as an embedded systems engineer um, in a successful product development firm called Brash, as well as he's taking roots into the entrepreneurial field 
with his own ventures. He will speak about the trending home automation space in assistive tech and its impact on solutions for people with disabilities. Um, and lastly, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, I will moderate that as well. So Tetra overview and assistive devices. So Tetra Society of North America, for those that don't know what the nonprofit is about, it's one of the six charitable uh, societies that fall under the Disability Foundation that provide accessible and meaningful activities. So other um, charity nonprofits that fall under Disability Foundation are uh, Disabled Sailing Association, Adaptive Music Society, Gardeners Association, quite a few others. In regards to Tetra as a whole, Tetra has grown to over 30 local chapters, providing customized solutions to over 40 communities across Canada and the US, currently spanning over 300 Tetra volunteers who design and build hundreds of custom assistive devices based on a request basis from the local community. And just quick holistic like overview, we are a nonprofit. We recruit skilled volunteers to design and construct unique customized assistive devices for individuals with disabilities with no cost for labor. So the customized part is bold because I'm going to talk about that in detail in the next few slides. And we say since it's completely volunteer run, we usually get requests from the local community. It could be an individual with a disability themselves who directly contacts us or their um, medical doctor or a family doctor or uh, any, through any other avenue, it's very easy to contact us. So there's no cost for labor as well as um, any material cost could be done, provided through the individual themselves or through the multiple vending avenues that we have if one cannot. So what is assistive technology? Um, I know I can attest that majority of you already know what that is here who are attending, but just in regards to in the midst of the points that will be made on into the next slides, I'll just quickly go over this. So basically any item, piece of equipment, software program or product system that is used to increase, maintain or improve functional capabilities of persons with disabilities. So the type of disabilities we see individuals that come through us um, it could vary from cognition, hearing, mobility, speech, vision. Um, and what we usually see through Tetra is individuals who have a combination of more than one, which is why it's hard to find assistive technology in the market. The space itself, the assistive technology space, um, just a high level, um, and especially since all of our volunteers, when we get requests, we really dig deep into what's out there before deciding that nothing out there exists that we should take this on and make a completely customized solution. So. The space itself varies from very low uh, to high technology, as can see in this image on the, my left. There is tremendous industry growth. Um, a lot more companies have been evolving, a lot more solutions have been out there, but it's still quite limited. The importance of accessibility has become higher. Uh, you could definitely see a lot of mainstream companies, social media channels, like especially when you look at the main ones, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, making their user interfaces a lot more accessible. Um, always from my perspective, it's not it's nothing that we're going above and beyond for. It's it's a lot of uh, righting a lot of wrongs. So accessibility was never taken into consideration and now it has been, but still behind. The space is still a niche market. Uh, what that means is that... Um, Sorry, Zara. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could we please have you put your slides into presentation view? I'm sorry, we're just seeing your notes. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, I wish if someone had mentioned that earlier. No problem. Okay. One second. Uh, it is actually in presentation mode. Okay, let's see here. Stop share. I think you have to change the display settings. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back and share. I, I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, we're definitely seeing your screen. We just are also, when you're slide going through the slides, we're just not seeing them in a full screen. We're seeing. At the top, uh, Zara, try the display settings there. Yep. Swap presenter view yep. and social. Yep. You see that? I think that's good now. 
Yes, thank yes, you we see, see your full screen now. Oh my gosh, I wish if someone may just called me out right from the beginning. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just go back quickly. Okay. Um, we okay. It was just smaller. So you could see my full uh, screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. we, we could see the slides in their full, but we also saw the notes page. So we just condensed it. So oh, um, you're, you're fine. you can you're start fine. where you left off. We'll be absolutely fine. Okay, awesome. Um, that's unfortunate, but uh, I'll continue. So assistive okay. technology space, um, as I mentioned, it's a niche market. And uh, what that means is that it only targets uh, a few, a, a specific target audience. So for example, people with disabilities, and not a lot of people are, uh, are thriving to get into this space because they don't see it as profitable. So for example, a cell phone, it does not fall within a niche market. It hits a much bigger audience. And that's why we see quite a bit of limitations um, in regards to a lot of the assistive tech out there is used to address one type of disability. And so as mentioned earlier, individuals have um, a few different uh, or a combination of disabilities and there's also quite a bit of customization limitations. What that, what I can say is that in there, and my next slide will explain that even better, is that being with the current technology and uh, manufacturing methods, it's uh, it's hard to customize for an individual. Um, and then you could see at times that the tech device itself will not be as successful. So. A quick example of customization in assistive technology, hearing aids, um, since with the trend of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, over 10 million people are now wearing 3D printing, printed hearing aids with 97% of all hearing aids globally now being created using additive manufacturing. And uh, this is due to the fact that you can actually customize them per individual. And the fact that now you can customize them per individual the hearing aids being returned has reduced from bad fit of 40% to 10%. So the technologies or use of 3D printing and just the expansion of that is helping assistive technology in general. So what type of assistive devices does Tesla design and build? We look at things that are not commercially available. And as mentioned, the assistive devices space itself is still limited. It's still considered niche market and there's still lots out there that's not uh, done for people with disabilities. Any items that will be cost prohibitive. So if something does exist out there, but extremely expensive and all the way across the world, and if someone can build something a lot uh, cheaper, we take that on. Modifications or additions to existing devices and anything that's not a medical device or must be fitted by a certified medical practitioner. Um, in regards to categories, we take on anything from communication, mobility, learning, daily living, personal care, recreational. So this is important that I highlighted in red, recreational, so anything in sports, music. And so it's not just uh, assistive tech for independent living, that's important for sure, but we look at holistically at a whole person's uh, life. So just a few examples that I'll go through just to kind of touch base on the assistive devices that Tetra does and gives you a sense of what I meant not commercially available, cost prohibitive, etc. So this is a height adjustable chair that was built from some of our volunteers. The disability that the individual had is that she didn't have both arms and so she wanted a chair that could help her in the kitchen or just anywhere else in the house. So how this chair works is that she uses her legs to uh, manually adjust the height. So it's pretty cool because a lot of these chairs that you see in the market, you'd need to use your hand to manually adjust the height. So nothing like that existed out there. Uh, another cool device here is that this disability, a child has multiple disabilities, cognitive and physical. And uh, he was a growing boy and uh, he really liked this, um, kind of I would say a miniature swing uh, slash seating um, chair that he had. But since he was growing, there was nothing in the market that could adhere to uh, having that same soothing motion. So one of our volunteers built something, uh, a much larger um, kind of soothing chair. It was incorporated with electronics and a motor and uh, the family was extremely happy with this. 
And so it was very hard to find anything like that out there in the market. Let's go on to the next one. So this is a modified walker. I can say that probably a lot of you know what a walker is, uh, just a device that helps individuals who don't have, who have limited leg mobility and have a hard time walking, they need help with stability. So the individual had limited leg mobility as well as very limited grip strength. And, um, and so this is where you see a combination of disabilities as well as modifying an existing assistive technology. So the volunteers put some a force uh, sensor and a few circuitry that could kind of, instead of gripping the and adding strength to the walker, individual can just simply touch and the uh, brakes will be applied. And just quickly, uh, adaptive tricycle, we get a lot of these um, uh, requests in. So the individual had a cerebral palsy. He likes to ride with his dad. The original one he had completely outgrown and broke down and features that the family wanted commercially were not available and cost prohibitive. So our volunteers made something very unique for him. And last example that I have here, neck clay. So the disability uh, is limited mobility. And this is a product that Tetra actually made and will go off that anyone can buy it at a very uh, minimal cost from the Tetra website. So because we've got a lot of requests in the past regarding communication, not being able to communicate with a computer and laptop. Um, so limitations to commercially available products out there. Um, instead of using a mouse and cursor, an individual has multiple options, joystick, touch sensors, button switch, and gyroscope. And uh, basically it's a user-friendly customizable device that enables people with a range of mobility limitations to independently operate a computer. This is the last example I have here. There's quite a few coming up, um, but just wanted to give everyone an idea of why uh, Tetra takes on specific requests as opposed to others. And so I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Natalie Tambe, uh, who will go to talk about design principles and design thinking applied to Tetra. Uh, Natalie, the screen looks good for you. It does, thank you. Um, I won't stay long on this slide, uh, but I just wanted to introduce myself very quickly. Um, I am a, a, an instructor at Carleton University in the field of industrial design. Um, I have brown hair, brown eyes, um, and uh, big, big curly hair, uh, bright eyes and a big smile because I'm, I'm very passionate about um, what Tetra does and uh, it makes me happy to talk about it to anyone who will listen. Um, uh, I think I covered the basics for my, oh, I'm uh, in my late thirties for perhaps the 10th time. So uh, that's about, uh, I've had many iterations of my 39th birthday. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are design principles and why do they matter? Um, that's basically what I'm talking about in terms of uh, how Tetra approaches um, building custom assistive devices. So in general terms, uh, I'm sure you may have heard design principles, what, what they stand for before, uh, but they're basically a set of core values that act as a compass for all of the projects that a, a company might approach. Um, in the sense of Tetra, uh, they build innovative solutions for people with physical dis disabilities to overcome environmental barriers and that help provide greater independence, quality of life, and inclusion. Um, so there's a shared affinity from Tetra volunteers to tinker, to modify, problem solve, and we help others. Um, so we invent for the greater good and try to make things equal for everybody. Um, next. Um, the reason for this, um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, but there's an understanding that there are progressive needs that are need, uh, need to be fulfilled in someone's life experience in order for them to feel uh, like they belong and to be able to self-actualize and have the most fulfilling um, uh, 
life experience. So first you would help with, or someone would need to fulfill uh, the basic needs for survival, such as air, water, food, shelter. Uh, then once those things are satisfied and it's secure, then they go to uh, you know personal security, employment, resources, health, poverty. The bottom line of this is that Tetra really can impact so many different levels of someone's um, daily or, or extracurricular lifestyle. And we try so much to make everything accessible and to help with the uh, inclusivity, with visibility, with independence. And we just try to make the experience of every person who calls to Tetra to make it just a little bit better and a little bit less um, restricted. Um, next slide. So about the team, um, uh, one of the most special things about the volunteer body of the Tetra volunteer group is, as um, Zara, may have, Zara may have mentioned before, is that we're just a collective of tinkerers, makers, carpenters, engineers, educators, motivators, specialists, <laughs> engineers, uh, et cetera. And this can vary from chapter to chapter. There are so many chapters across North America and even into the US. Um, it is a gathering of diversely talented and hands-on people with a desire to do good things and champion accessibility and fair play. So I, I hate to be, um, I don't wanna be reading this out loud, but it, 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 there's a lot there. Um, and then the availability of time, depending on our own personalities, our own specializations, the things that make us excited, we may gravitate to a specific uh, request to, to jump in there and help uh, a specific, uh, on a specific project. Um, but there's a very um, collaborative atmosphere within Tetra, which is really fascinating. And because it's so multidisciplinary, they're really a really nice resource of skills and um, resources available to, to tackle any problem. Um, so we have kind of this like open source mentality and we share a database amongst all of the chapters where different solutions may have been uh, obtained that we can share with other, other members. Next slide, please. I think I'm probably talking too fast, but that's what happens when I'm a bit nervous. So. <laughs> um, how do we get there? So the mindset um, of what design, um, what design thinking is, is that we align ourselves with the client and we need to meet with them. And this is very early on in the stage, in the, in the early stage of the development of the project. Um, we adopt the philosophy of never force someone without that someone. So as much as possible, we try to include uh, the person who's requesting the, um, the uh, intervention or the, or the device, um, because uh, we try to collaborate with them at every opportunity and that ensures better success. Uh, we develop empathy for the user. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. Either we go visit them in context, we go and have conversations with them if possible. Uh, we try to understand uh, the task that is required. Um, there may be multiple points of view in terms of the usability of a product. So sometimes it's from the user themselves. Sometimes it's through, um, you know, advocated by the, the caregiver, what, um, what other things that we need to consider in terms of uh, logistics or uh, manageability. Um, so going in context can really help um, kind of streamline the process as well. Um, the next step would be to kind of visualize or model the ideas usually. And then sometimes we have the ability to check the database for pre-existing, which it's a bit of a challenge um, because there are so many different kind of keywords and every situation is so incredibly custom, but we do have this this database at our disposal, at our disposal which is very, um, an excellent resource. Um, and we try to learn from other iterations. So um, I will elaborate a tiny bit on iterations, but I think uh, a lot of that will be covered with Scott. Um, and it's just basically going through the steps to make and then revise the product. Um, and then we lean into the diverse experience and skill sets of our network. So we follow what's called the design process to get to our solution. Next slide. So the design process in general, like very vague terms, is basically um, there are different um, versions of the design process that you might find online. Uh, some of them have five, some of them have, have up to seven steps and then you are in between. But in you know, loose terms, it's basically about understanding and defining the problem, uh, being able to be empathetic to the person who is the user, 
um, doing some sketch models or some trials some experimentation, a little bit of research and development, create some iterations. So try things out, um, have them fail, try them out again, revise a little bit, and then test. So the test phase and the iteration and test phase may take a few cycles. Um, but what that entails is basically making a, a working prototype that we can then give to uh, the recipient. They can try it out for a little while. And then final adjustments are made and hopefully we've resolved um, you know, an issue. Um, so it's basically in loose, again, loose terms is an approach for breaking down a large project into smaller chunks. And this kind of system of following these steps usually yields to um, a, a continual improvement on a, on a product. So it, it is meant to be cyclical because there's never really a perfect solution. Going on to the next slide is just going a little bit more into detail as to how we adapt the design process when it's not a standard uh, application. We're not trying to create a, a product for market. We're doing something that's incredibly specific and custom. So we would start much along the same lines. We would define the project. So it's kind of, it takes an in-depth understanding what the user needs are, what their range of motion is, where is the obstruction, where is the, um, where is, where, where does it break down? Where does, where is the contact between the person and the activity? Where's the disconnect? Um, and then there's the empathy stage where we try to gain a little bit more information. So each situation is unique. We try to avoid as much as possible to impose our solutions. We try to uh, avoid assumptions and we really try to keep an open mind and listen to everything that the person has to say in terms of what has worked in the past, where there are difficulty, uh, where's the pain points. And that may, you know, again, that may incorporate um, the feed input from the caretaker, if there is one, um, or other uh, family support system that may have other ideas or other concerns that, about how the product should, or the, the thing, the solution uh, should, should work out. Um, at this point, also, we try to take and make space for the user to elaborate on ideas that they may have. Um, very often, um, the people that we are trying to design for already have a really good idea of what works for them. They know their limitations very well and where their where, where their strengths lie. So they're able, if they're able to communicate those things to us, it can go a long way in expediting a good solution. And then we go into the sketch and model phase. Um, so there are many, you know, inexpensive ways that we can test things out. We have a habit of like buying things and chopping them up and reconnecting things together and MacGyvering different solutions. And that I think that is what makes me so excited about um, this kind of design process was that really the sky's the limit because we are not doing this for the goal of creating a repeatable product for production, for um, profit. Uh, we're really able to just kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of what is the thing that we're trying to accomplish? What is the actual thing that we need to do? And sometimes it may be, um, you know, kind of putting different bits and pieces together to formulate a brand new solution of something that doesn't exist. Um, but what's exciting is that we don't have, we don't owe any company anything. We're able to just go in there and say, okay, I like this from this feature and I like this from this. And we're able to create sometimes things that would be very cost prohibitive with a very low cost to, to the end um, recipient. Again, iteration is incredibly important for us. So it's a fantastic way for us to revise. And, you know, maybe we come up with a really sound idea and we try things out and we go and we change it and we try something else. And we have to go back in there and modify something to make it better or smoother or more comfortable. So there's these little kind of steps that have to take place that are so important into making it not only um, comfortable, but a successful adaptation of the product for the person. Um, and it might take a few a few runs through the system, and that's perfectly normal. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, another challenge may be logistical. Sometimes some of the things that we design for people are season specific, or they may be situational, um, you know, specific. So it may mean that we can't test the product right away, and sometimes the person is very busy and can't we can't collaborate. Um, 
on a on a regular schedule. So um, there are times where this kind of flexibility in in getting the thing tested needs to exist, which is you know um, usually unavailable in in the mass production type of setting. So we really enjoy the ability to kind of work around the person's availability and schedule and get all the kinks worked out, get it tested. And then we kind of enjoy um, being able to get feedback, um, maybe testimonials, maybe um, other, other players or other stakeholders in, in the whole process can, can uh, jump in and say, oh, you know what? I noticed that this, this is maybe a problem point and we'll do some final tweaking. And then we have a successful fitted um, custom assistive device for one of our one of our requests. Um, next slide. I think I'm almost right on time. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, so Tetra takeaways. Um, iterative design is incredibly important, and it just basically means to be able to prototype and do several versions of something. Uh, we do kind of have an open source mentality. We are, especially with, um, you know, printed circuit boards and things that are kind of available. Uh, we're able to, um, and, and this shared database, um, the intention is to be able to collaborate and to have availability to so many interesting resources. Uh, we do have a collaborative style. Um, so there may be times where we reach out to another member that has, um, you know, done some interesting problem solving that could be beneficial to a new situation. Um, social innovation. So the chapters are always encouraged to seek out local initiatives. So each chapter may have its own kind of uh, little satellite uh, projects going or uh, participation from other um, schools or universities or other programs, which is always interesting. Um, and then uh, culture of innovation. So by removing the cost of labor and design time, we can ensure that so many more opportunities can be visited and explored. Um, and then finally, because we're not working for profit, we're able to genuinely kind of jump in there and try to make something that works. And it's basically a true blue sky type of thinking where sky's the limit. And that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, that was a really good overview of a uh, design process that kind of Tetra incorporates. So thanks a lot. If you guys have any questions, especially to what Natalie has spoken about, just be sure to type them in the Q&A and then we'll have the last 10, 15 minutes to address any questions that you guys have. Um, so next up, next up, I'm gonna invite Scott Bulbrook. Uh, he'll be talking about design approach. So as I introduced Scott earlier, he is a technical innovator and I like to call him a seasoned Tetra volunteer. He has been here way longer than I am. And at one point I was kind of under his wing when I started volunteering with Tetra. Um, so Scott, are you ready to go? You're kind of muted. I'm ready to go. Okay, awesome. Okay. So um, thank you, Zara, and thank you, Natalie. I think basically I'm just going to repeat everything Natalie said, but I'll do it against the, uh, the background of some of the projects I've done. Um, and I'm going to go a little off script, uh, by way of introduction of myself and the visual description, uh, I'm an integrated circuit designer. And so I have a background in semiconductor physics and I've spent my whole life and career, uh, designing and building things, but, uh, one of the things that Natalie touched on was the empathy uh, part of things. And, and for me personally, most of, of what she talked about, about building prototypes and testing and iterating really came to second nature. But uh, that's something I learned through, uh, through Tetra, especially working with the disabled community was, uh, was the empathy uh, part of things. Um, so let's, um, give a shout out to Zara who uh, took over the chapter and is, and is keeping it going, which is wonderful. Her predecessor was a gentleman named Paul Marriage who recruited me in. And originally the chapter was Paul and four or five other guys who were probably all in their eighties and nineties now, uh, who as engineers and builders, I certainly looked up to 
And, and one of the projects you showed there, uh, Zara, was one that was headed up by Natalie. But Natalie, you reached out for help to Gord and those other guys. And that chair, which in the picture looked very, very elegant and simple, uh, the stuff that was inside that adjustable height chair was a feat of engineering beyond anything. I'm certainly not capable of matching those guys. So, so Paul and, and, and all those other guys I, I really look up to. Uh, so I'm circling back to the visual description, uh, but I'm going to stick on getting comfortable with the client. And another thing about our chapter is we've got some people who are both clients and volunteers, which has been uh, really helpful to me personally, I think, to the group as a whole. And, and one person in particular, and I'll give this as an example of this uh, empathetic and getting to know people better. Uh, so, you know, Ashley Sullivan, who, who's a part of our uh, group, um, is both a, a volunteer and, and a client. And I got to know her more as a volunteer first, but she pulled me aside and asked me to do a project for her. And it basically was a hairbrush on the end of a stick, which she needs to use in the shower to wash the back of her head. And to quote Ashley, I have really short arms. And she made a bit of a, a T-Rex joke about that, how she couldn't wash the back of her hair. And, uh, you know, just to diffuse things and find out about a person's disability. And honestly, to this day, I don't actually know in medical terms what Ashley's condition is. It's never really important. But as it pertained to that project, uh, yeah, her arms are short. That's, that's all I needed to know. And, and to, to make it be uh, something you can talk about. Uh, so let me now continue with my introduction and visual description. I'm wearing a blue shirt with a bit of a pattern on it that's looking a bit weird in the, uh, in the uh, video feed. So I probably should have picked a different shirt. I have short gray hair. Uh, I play a lot of hockey and I'm often described by other people, I've overheard this as the guy with the big smile, the guy who never stops smiling. Uh, and that helps from time to time to diffuse some of the heated uh, situations you find yourself in in, in hockey. Um, and I'm an older guy with, uh, someone told me to say graying, but it's not. My hair is gray. I'm an old guy. <laughs> so anyway, that's enough about that. Uh, so uh, Zara, I think you've got some slides that just have some pictures of some of the projects I've done, right? Yeah, definitely. So a few uh, a few of the projects that you've completed, because I know you've completed a lot. Yeah, so just pop them up and I'll uh, I'll talk yeah. about. Uh, yeah, so in fact, if you just go straight to the picture of Christine sitting in her chair. Okay. Um, yeah, well, let's show this video. This this was the problem that, that we were trying to solve, right? Is, uh, so Christine has cerebral palsy. Uh, unlike a lot of people with cerebral palsy that I've met, uh, she can. She lived alone. Uh, she's she's six. She's sixty, and and uh, was fiercely defensive about her independence. A, a person with cerebral palsy living alone is is pretty rare. Uh, she can also speak. She's verbal. Uh, most of the people with cerebral palsy I've met cannot speak at all. Uh, it's very slow, and if you want to have a conversation with with Christine, you have to be extremely patient. Uh, and that was part of, of the learning. She can also pull herself and stand up from time to time. So she needed a way to get to the washroom at, at night. Uh, I guess that the, the video is not really working, Zara, but if you just go to the, to the picture of, of her in her chair with the- uh, The with completed the one? Smile. Yeah, yeah, why not? Okay. Um, there she is. So she had actually already designed this. She just needed what was fundamentally a box made of plywood with wheels on it, and she didn't want to get into her electric wheelchair to go to the washroom. Uh, her apartment was small. It was really hard to get in and out of the electric wheelchair, and she was afraid that she was going to harm the battery, as it turns out, was part of, part of the issue. So, you know, I didn't do anything very fancy in terms of building a plywood box. It was exactly the size she wanted. There was a cool thing I did do as a physicist that you can't really see here, but uh, in that left-hand picture, you'll notice there's a blue wheel uh, 
and that there's three wheels on the side, and that blue wheel is just a tiny bit taller than the other wheels, and it allows her to spin spin the box, and that was the that was the big limitation, and so that's her trying it out, and oh, we had a hug after that, and it 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 took me about 10 hours to figure out what she really wanted and uh, one night to, to build the box. Um, and you can see by her smile there, that's uh, on Natalie's uh, hierarchy that, that, you know, I got to self-actualize that night. That, that certainly was wonderful for me, uh, but she had it in her head all along. And, and that was the biggest part was uh, going to visit her and, and spending a couple hours with her uh, letting her explain. I've also done like a bunch of other um, projects with, with Christine that uh, I haven't told Zara about or she'd make me fill out a form. Um, so, but just uh, go, I go visit her once in a while. Um, let's keep going. Um, yeah. And uh, just to uh, mention uh, Scott, so it's interesting that you mentioned how it took you 10 hours to uh, kind of understand what she needs, but then it took you quite to actually build the product so and we mentioned the iterative design process uh, I think it's interesting to note that a few other volunteers had put together a solution for her but it didn't work for her and as you mentioned she knew what she needed so really applying that empathy and listening to what exactly she wanted and what would work for her and what would make things well and you kind of uh, took that time to really understand and uh, patients came in so, and in the end, she was really happy with the solution that she got. Yeah, and honestly, you know, in terms of me being a volunteer and being on a journey of sort of personal development, uh, that's that's what's in it for me. Um, okay, so the, the project you and I worked on, Zara, was, was Winter Sleep. So, uh, Natalie mentioned uh, being collaborative and having a database um, and, and uh, being able to access different technology. So, so a project that I won't talk about here, uh, I, I needed to uh, attach something to some bars and, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then I realized that the thing I was trying to modify had a lot in common with bicycles. And I got on Amazon and the very next day I had exactly the clamp I needed to make the modification. It was four bucks and it was a thing that was made for bicycles. Um, these winter sleds, I happened to have some old downhill skis uh, laying around the house. And, um, you know, if you think like a physicist or a material scientist, downhill skis are really high tech. Like the way they bend and the things they do uh, is, is really quite impressive in and of itself. And so uh, what we were able to do was basically put what were effectively some chairs onto some downhill skis to create some winter sleds. Uh, and so the way we attached the, the chairs to the sleds, um, and this is a great one, yeah, you can sort of see uh, where the ski is attached, I basically uh, cut a boot shaped piece of plywood and I'm using the, the binding of the ski to attach the ski. And as, as the chair goes along and hits the curb and does all the same things that a skier does, if any of you ski, um, you know, those things are incredibly resilient and, and, and very, very useful. However, uh, as we talked to the different people who wanted to use the uh, the sleds, uh, we found out a lot of really interesting things. So, so this, this was a particularly fun one. So, so this was for a young lad who was uh, roughly 10. And, uh, and so as a kid, kind of involving him in the design process was, was a little more difficult. Uh, his mom was describing the use case. And what it is, is she liked to pile young John and his older brothers who were a little more of a handful we got to meet them all and they were you know you can imagine three or four brothers uh aged I don't know eight to 16 and there was rough housing and everything and she would try to get them all over to the toboggan hill to burn off some energy but she couldn't get John over there uh easily because his wheelchair wouldn't go 
And she certainly couldn't leave those maniacs at the Toboggan Hill by themselves uh, while she doubled back and got John. And so not only did she need a sled that she could pull John and the crew over in, in one trip, but she would also pile all the stuff on top of John. So there were blankets and lunches and all the gear. Uh, she also needed John to do an exercise where he straightened his legs out and he didn't like doing it. And so what you can't see in this uh, inversion, because it actually broke and I had to fix it, is uh, an extending, almost like a drawer that comes out so she could force John to straighten his legs for, for at least a few minutes while they took their trip over. There was a seat belt. I think you sourced that, uh, Zara, and some other design considerations. The whole thing breaks down so that they could pile it in the, in the garage for, for the summer. But finally, I thought of a way to um, try to get John a little more involved. And I, I asked him what color he would like to see it painted. And he said, well, could I please have Ottawa Senators? And so I was like, okay. Uh, and this is, I think, yeah, that's in my garage. You can see, yeah, that's, that picture is taken in my garage. It's a little earlier. So we, we did the red, white, and black. I eventually uh, put um, Senators logos and a few other stickers. I, I knew some guys at the Senators uh, in the marketing department. They sent us some stuff. And in the end, not only did we give him his senator sled, but we had Cody Cece and Mark Stone there to, to help present it to him and they, they signed it and everything. And so, you know, John was super happy to use this and it was like a useful thing. Uh, that was a real fun day. Um, okay, let's see what the next one was. Um, ah, yes. Okay, so this was a, a, an old, a slightly older person named Chris. And you can see it's basically the same design. The chair is a little more upright. And the thing about Chris was that he doesn't use a wheelchair normally. And he needed a way to go for a walk in the woods. And, and you know, his, his ability to walk was uh, impaired enough that it just wasn't easy for him to be out and about uh, on a trail. But he was adamant that the thing we built him not look like a wheelchair. And so this was my best effort to make it be as upright as possible. And, uh, you know, again, um, I think this person was down in Kempville and, and Paul ended up doing the delivery, but brought me back a person of, of Chris getting pushed around in the woods. They, they had a, like a, a huge backyard with trails in it. Uh, so fundamentally, it's the same kind of cool thing we did with the downhill skis on the bottom, uh, but, but Chris was adamant that the, the chair itself had to look a certain way. We also collaborated a bit with the person who actually pushed the chair and made sure you can see that uh, bar at the top, there was a little bit of iteration to make sure that was the right height uh, for that person. And then the third one is, uh, uh, yes. Um, Sarah was a, a little girl. And so I kind of, well, I had some leftover red paint from the uh, Senator's project, but I was thinking Disney princess uh, when I did this. So this was a little girl who was uh, maybe five or six. And so, you know, collaborating with her uh, wasn't super easy. Uh, worked with their parents a little bit. In this case, they wanted to pull her. Uh, and so you can see there's some uh, holes in the front there. Uh, where they attach a rope and, and, and pulled her with it. And again, she was, she was quite pleased um, with that. And it, it had that kind of, uh, uh, best I could do anyway, some snowflakes. What was that Disney movie that was at the time uh, Frozen? <laughs> anyway, she seemed to like it, so yay. Uh, and again, it, it, it leverages that, uh, that downhill ski uh, technology that we had. Um, so that's a really cool example because all, all, all of them, you know, it was getting input from the client and the caregiver and then also, uh, you know, finding uh, unique ways to, to in, involve the, the clients uh, who had very, very different uh, thoughts and, and desires and ability to, to collaborate. 
Uh, what else have you got for me, Zara? I think this yeah, is like definitely. Scott's greatest hits you got going here, right? Yeah, no, for sure. We have one more uh, project to show, and uh, I do remember these projects uh, thoroughly. And it was interesting how an adaptive sled was wanted, but each uh, individual wanted specific features. And uh, even in regards to like the angling, the footrest, all of that, which was hard to find uh, online, basically. But uh, no, I do recall that everyone was super happy and uh, they get to join their family on uh, just going out in the winter. Exactly. And exactly. I think that you guys are both raising a really important thing too, is that um, a lot of the times is that they don't want it to look like something that's made for assistive. Exactly. Yeah. So like, they, yeah. they feel empowered when it's something that is theirs and theirs alone and um, that gives them that extra mobility. Yeah. No, for sure. That's a really good point, Natalie. Okay. So, um, okay. Yeah. So this one, um, <clears throat> this was for um, a guy named uh, Robert, um, another person uh, with cerebral palsy. In this case, uh, he's nonverbal and uh, also has all, all the um, coordination challenges and spasm challenges that, that, that come with, with cerebral palsy. And so since he, he's, he's, oh man, he's in his thirties anyway. Um, and since he was very, very young, uh, he's been using uh, what you can broadly call a bliss board, but this is really a homemade bliss board that his dad had made him and slowly built up over the years. And those, uh, those yellow pages on the right uh, were new words that he had added. Um, now, he had tried using some of the speech synthesis tools and uh, they're incredibly expensive. And he just had a learning curve that was unacceptable uh, because the, the words were in different places and it, and it wasn't a reflection of his, of his existing board. And so the original project was to ask me whether I could actually build an electronic version of the bliss board where the, uh, the words that he pressed could actually be stored and formed into a sentence. And then he could hit a read button and it would speak the sentence. Um, so I started working on it and uh, I, I um, you know, the, the technical details of how I did it uh, aren't, aren't super uh, interesting. I, 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 it's actually a website that you can log on to and, and there were some advantages of doing it that way. Uh, but as I, as I worked with them, I started to realize, uh, first of all, when you're talking to Steve, um, you have to kind of scooch up beside him, otherwise his bliss board is upside down. And, and so um, being friends with Steve involves uh, being closer to him um, and his arms are always flying all over the place. So occasionally you get a smack, uh, but you know, that's okay. And uh, you know, uh, I've learned that it's, it's okay to sort of grab his arm and make it be that he's not punching you in the face and he doesn't mind. He also likes to pound his fist on the table twice for yes and once for no which is, uh, you know, hard to, to make electronic. So the, the main thing about this, though, was that if, if he needed something specific, like, you know, I'd like to go to the washroom, please, or, or um, some other sentence where he was fulfilling a need that would be very low at the bottom of, of Natalie's uh, chart uh, of, of, of human needs, the original project was only going to enable him to be left alone and ignored long enough for him to punch in the sentence and then he could hit read and, and make it easier on caregivers uh, to interact with him and save their time, not his time. And so as we, as we built this tool, I, I started to realize that in a way it was going to do more harm than good. Uh, but what we discovered along the way was this became a really easy way for Steve to write emails. So we took the read button 
And it's not really a speech synthesis machine at all anymore. It's an email generator. And so now to this day, I mean, it's been uh, how long, sorry, three or four years, I still get emails from, uh, from Steve and he, and he generates them using, using the board. Uh, so that became a, a really important thing. Another thing that happened was, um, let me make sure I use the right words for this. So when you're working with someone who's nonverbal and has a lot of disabilities, uh, you're unsure what their cognitive abilities are. And it's, it's really challenging to kind of suss out um, where a person is at. And so on Steve's physical bliss board that he's had since he was a young child, there are pictures to go with all the words. And when I was trying to build that tool, um, finding a way to get the pictures and put them on the buttons and share space with the text was really challenging. Yeah, and Scott, we, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Um, it's really cool, the digital bliss board and uh, time's catching up with us just a little bit. Um, but just to wrap up, any final uh, comments? Uh, I already saw a comment in the chat saying this is really cool to do emails with. But I know uh, from when this project was completed, it saved uh, uh, Steve lots of time in communicating. Yeah, and the key was he didn't he didn't need the pictures at all. That was that's what I was leading up to, and then it was his input that no, I, I can read, like I'm good. I just need the word. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and a few people were actually a little surprised by that. Um, and we've, we've continued to customize that board and it's more of a collaborative uh, project. And one of his, uh, the people in his life has actually taken over the, the programming as well and, and learned how to do that. I think that's all I had, right, Zara? And, and, yeah, you know, no, so it's really good. Those were just a few of the projects that you've done because, and you've done quite a bit with the, the team and Tetra overall. Uh, but thank you so much, Scott. If anyone has any questions, really them through the Q&A. We'll still have a few minutes in the end. Um, so last but not least, Dominic Peters, who is more of a newer volunteer, but he's definitely really stepped up and uh, really teaching a lot of the Tetra volunteers quite a few new things in regards to home automation space. Um, so as mentioned, Dominic works as an embedded systems engineer at Brash. Uh, he's also delved in the entrepreneurial world and has ventures of his own. And uh, Dominic, are you ready to go? I am. Can you guys uh, hear and see me okay? Yep. Awesome, great. So thank you. And Scott, that was, that was really some great storytelling. I think got so comfortable listening to you talk there that I uh, almost forgot I'm presenting next. <laughs> so anyway, back to the uh, introduction here. As Zara said, my name is Dominic. Um, physically, I'm a white guy in my 20s, blonde hair, blue eyes. I actually graduated from Carleton a couple of years ago, so it's a real pleasure to be back here, you know, virtually, of, virtually of course, alongside so many others who are passionate about the assistive technology space. Um, I'm joining you guys from our downtown office here at Brash Inc., which is a product development firm where I've been an embedded system engineer for the past four years at Brash. A lot of the stuff we design is kind of consumer electronics, wearables, some medical devices, but there's an overarching theme these days and that everything from your coffee maker to your vacuum to your car is connected to the internet. And I think we're seeing that same theme show itself at the Tetra Society where more and more problems and solutions uh, faced by individuals with disabilities involve some form of technology adaptation. So. Today, I'd like to speak to you guys about a specific type of internet connected technology, namely home automation. This is an area that's seen a ton of growth in recent years, um, so much so that the auto branch of the Tetra Society now has a working group dedicated to home automation solutions. And as a member of that group, my goal today is kind of to give you guys a quick introduction on what home automation is and how it can be applied as an assistive technology for persons with disabilities. Uh, thanks, we're on the right slide here. So when we talk about home automation, you know, we're very broadly referring to the automatic control of systems within a home. So some early examples of this might include lights running on timers, or if you recall those, actually those early 2000s video commercials of people clapping their hands to turn off and on their lights. 
that could be considered a very primitive form of home automation. Then came along the age of Wi-Fi and low power wireless electronics, which really allowed for far more complex devices that could remain connected to the internet at all times. You guys might've heard the term IOT, which stands for internet of things. So, you know, anything being connected to the internet. Um, at the same time, mobile phones went from being, well, phones um, to basically little computers in our pockets, which became the perfect interfacing points between occupants and their home and their network of connected devices. So as you can imagine, kind of as cost went down and accessibility of the technology increased, um, really we saw a proliferation of these smart home accessories. And suddenly, you know, you could buy smart energy saving thermostats, automatic lighting, doorbells, you name it. And I'm sure if many of you guys at home have an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home, uh, so when I say the phrase, Alexa, turn off the lights, <laughs> If anyone's now sitting in the dark, you know, thank you for demonstrating the power of home automation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the benefits of a home automation system for the average user are mostly, you know, in time and energy. So if you have a smart home thermostat, you know, it'll learn when you're at home and only turn on the furnace when you need it, reducing your monthly gas or electricity bill. <laughs> I'm seeing comment here that someone's light went off. That's great. Um, Sorry, back to that. Can we go back to the other slide? Uh, before that? Oh, sorry, I was uh, after that one. Maybe we're on the right one, my apologies. No worries. Um, uh, similarly, you know, if you have a voice controlled light switch, it saves you getting out of bed if you're turning the kitchen light on, for example. However, for those living with disabilities or accessibility issues, it can be a really powerful tool that makes a difference in their independence and quality of life. And I think nothing drives this point home more than a quote I found online from a paraplegic that says, convenience for you is independence for me, right? So if we take that and we consider the previous example of just turning off a light switch while you're in bed, you know, while it might serve as a convenience to most people, it can be the difference between having to call a caretaker for someone who can't get out of bed on their own. You know, or if you take someone that's deaf, you know, with a simple doorbell camera and companion smartphone app, they can be alerted through the vibration of their phone or smartwatch that someone's at the front door. Uh, most consumers' smart home devices come with their own app or can be paired with voice assistants like Google Home or Amazon Alexa. Uh, voice control in particular is a really powerful tool for anyone with a physical disability. And I'd encourage anyone uh, to think about someone they know and consider how an off the shelf system like this might be able to help them in their everyday life. Next slide, please. So the question is, you know, if home automation uh, type solutions can be such a game changer for those with disabilities, why haven't we seen more solutions typically, you know, specifically targeting this area? And this is kind of multifaceted. There's a couple different reasons for this, but certainly one of the big ones is that no individual needs, no individual's needs and capabilities are exactly alike. You know, someone with a cognitive and a hearing disability is going to need an entirely different solution from someone who is blind. And this often means that it doesn't make financial sense for a company to develop a product for a niche market. Um, to further the problem, the type of devices sold to people with disabilities, you know, motorized beds, uh, you could think electric door openers, voice control speaker phones, uh, usually use proprietary interfaces and they're not gonna be compatible with standard heart, uh, smart home systems. Next slide, please. I'd like to show you guys on the right hand side here, this is a picture of a device called a Quartet ECU, standing for Environmental Control Unit. And this, this device is used by one of our clients at the Tetra Society who suffers from late stage MS. With it, you know, she's able to use the speech command interface to control her motorized bed, open her door to visitors, control lights in an apartment, and generally live a, a relatively independent lifestyle. Devices like the Quartet ECU have been around for a long time, but they generally lag behind mainstream consumer technology and are tailored to a specific problem. Uh, also, you know, this device costs over $10,000, which can be out of reach for a majority of people. And on top of the high cost, you know, it can be difficult to source replacement parts, which is something we ran into when we initially took on this project. And like I said before, it doesn't interface at all with modern smart home systems. Next slide, please. 
the Tetra solution. So at Tetra, you know, we really pride ourselves in creating customized solutions not addressed by mainstream products. I think Zara has done a great job of, you know, pointing that out um, previously. So when this client came to us, it was clear to us that there weren't any off-the-shelf solutions that would fulfill her needs, um, including the very difficult task of adapting to her needs and her regressing capabilities as her condition continues to worsen. So our design goal, therefore, with this project would be to build a customized home management controller. Um, just speaking about some of the high-level requirements, you know, it should support multiple input types and configurations, such as a simple one-button interface or even a sip and puff straw where a user who doesn't have control of their um, arms is able to just use their mouth as an input. Um, it should be low cost and open source, making it broadly accessible to anyone who needs it, unlike a lot of the products on the market who are specialized and cost upwards of thousands of dollars like that Quartet ECU. And lastly, it should be capable of interfacing both with her existing equipment like the motorized bed, as well as mainstream smart home devices. Next slide, please. Um, around the same time as we began working on this project, uh, a really interesting development was unveiled in the smart home space. And this is a new protocol called Matter, um, which promised to unify communication standards between different smart home devices from different manufacturers. And to really see why this is important, um, it needs to be understood that at the moment, the home automation space is actually extremely fragmented. You have many factories using different radio technologies, different network protocols, different command sets. And the result is that when you buy a new home automation product, you as the consumer have to make sure that it's gonna be compatible with the rest of your smart home network. And it's really not a nice situation when you're locked into using you know, one manufacturer's products and it's equally difficult to design a custom device like a motorized bed controller that's gonna play nicely with your Google Home, your Amazon Alexa, et cetera. And you know, that's why it's so important that Matter is backed by, the Matter protocol is backed by all of the major players, including you know, Google, Apple, Amazon, Samsung, et cetera, because it ensures at least that in an ideal world, it becomes the de facto standard for all smart home devices moving forward. Um, a bit of background, the way it works, you know, Matter provides a set of generic device capability profiles. So for common devices like lights, smart outlets, et cetera, it doesn't really matter if you buy a smart uh, light from 10 different manufacturers, they should all behave exactly the same. And on top of these generic profiles, manufacturers can define custom profiles for proprietary or more complex devices. Um, so this is really important in the context of our home management controller that we're developing for this project. It's, it's really the key development, which allows off the shelf smart devices to work hand in hand with proprietary specialized equipment. Um, to give an example of this, you know, you can imagine being able to ask Alexa to raise the height of a, mo a motorized hospital bed or use a sip and puff input device to turn off the lights in your room. This is kind of the level of integration that we're aiming to achieve. And it's this new matter protocol, which is making it all possible. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so with that kind of background stuff out of the way, um, I can share a little bit more about our home management controller and what it will look like. It's actually called Sonia after our client who came to us with this request to fix her old quartet controller. Primarily, it's designed for people with more severe disabilities for whom off-the-shelf solutions just aren't appropriate. Um, on the right-hand side, you can actually see some early wireframes that we've developed that look, uh, show what the application will look like. It works on a basis of setting up sequential prompts that are spoken aloud to the user. So you can think, you know, TV on, open front door will be spoken out. And then the user has the opportunity to press a button or another simple input device at the right time, and it will perform that action. Of course, as I mentioned in the last slide, it'll be fully compliant with the Matter protocol. So, you know, you'll be able to use it and combine the prompts to control both off the shelf as well as specialized equipment. And eventually the goal with this project is actually to release it to the open source community. Um, there still exist thousands of different devices for specific disabilities and accessibility needs. We you know, recognize that we can't cover all of these and allowing others to develop custom adapters to support these types of devices, the only way to ensure broader adoption, ensure that it can work for you know, other people as well as just uh, this specific project. Next slide, please. 
Uh, next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, not sure how I'm doing on time here, but just to reiterate the key points, um, off the shelf home automation systems have come a long way in recent years and become, and really can become the difference in allowing someone to live independently. If you're interested, but don't know where to start, I would suggest doing a bit of online research. There's a lot of great sources or just drop me a message after the conference. Um, however, there's still no one size fits all solution on the market and no solution that adapts to the needs of users with multiple disabilities or limited functions. So this is a problem we at the Tetris Society recognize and aim to solve with the development of our open source home management controller. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this project, we don't yet have any public resources like website about it, but feel free again to contact myself or the Ottawa chapter of the Tetris Society. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. And with that, I'm gonna pass things back to Zara. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dominic. That was a really good overview of home automation space within assistive technology. And definitely we've been getting more and more requests uh, regarding this and uh, definitely could definitely make a big impact on people living with disabilities. So we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. Uh, it's time for Q&A and I noticed there was two questions. So, um, I think there was one question actually, if I see here. So, um, I see that Scott. So Claire Davis, um, sorry, one second. Let me stop sharing my screen. And, uh, okay. So Claire, you asked about uh, accommodating liability. If you design something with high risk, how do you ensure you're not held responsible? Uh, Scott, I see that you kind of went in and um, uh, made an answer. So, um, there's a specific application form that the individual has to go through a request for approval. And in there we have liability clauses that the uh, individual has to adhere to. And being this is completely volunteer run. So every volunteer that has come through our way and specifically me has the bought this and uh, everyone has the same concern, but uh, there are liability clauses. And whenever we take on a project, it's thoroughly investigated before we just Kind of give it off randomly to a random volunteer and we make sure that the person has the right skill set for it um as mentioned it's nothing that if it if it falls within medical device or something that could be um risky or anything like that that's completely evaluated and there's a whole team behind us and uh this question has come up time and time again and tetra as a whole has built over thousands of devices and to this date nothing has uh ever come back our way with uh, some type of court system or suing or liability or anything like that. So I hope that answers your question. I think I saw another question in here. Uh, Tetra's work is amazing, but my question slips back to mainstream and how we get these perfectly expensive assistive devices supported, funded by the government. Is there any future where we see this possible? So Scott, again, thank you. I see that you went in and answered. Yeah, sorry uh, about that. All right. No, oh, completely okay. fine. I just felt like, you know, talking out loud so everyone kind of hears out, hears it out. So you say we do have some access to funding in various forms. Generally speaking, we tend to work on projects that there are specific to the individual. It's more about specialization than the cost, definitely for sure. So a lot of the projects come our way require a lot of customization and uh, doesn't make it any less important. This is something I realized working through Tetra, just because not a lot of people may use it, but if that one individual who feels left behind and is not living as an independent and fulfilling life because of the not available in the market. No, it's still definitely still important. Um, it's not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of living a fulfilling independent life. So that's why we take on these projects. And um, so just to kind of reiterate on that and something that I did notice about Tetra's work, a lot of the R&D research and development that goes in and the solutions that come out are really amazing, which is why I joined Tetra in the first place, even though it's not, Tetra's not really marketed out there and people know what Tetra does. So um, for example, one product like NetClay that I talked about, because we saw so many requests coming through communication bases, Tetra is a nonprofit, but decided to take it on and kind of make it into a product that people can uh, potentially buy at a low cost. And uh, how do we get government funding for all these solutions. I definitely see a lot of solutions that are being uh, formed through Tetra could go on the market. And so many solutions that I'm like, wow, a lot of people can benefit from this. 
And unfortunately, we're at a stage where uh, these are not being brought out mainstream. Not a lot of people are seeing what these solutions are. They kind of get, they get provided to the clients. We call them a client, but they don't really pay for anything. And the client's happy with it and then goes off there. But it goes in our database and someone else can look through it and see uh, what they can leverage from that or do a similar design. So I do agree that a lot of these solutions, um, if there's major funding opportunities, the future for a lot of these products could be made for other people or go a bit more mainstream in the market. Um, so I hope that answers your question for the time being. So we only got two questions in Q&A and I know that it's, I'm happy and I'm sure that my colleagues here too, Scott, Natalie, and Dominic would be happy to answer more questions, but because it's 3.16 p.m., I don't want to take, we don't want to take over anybody else's talk, so um, I'm not sure anyone from Carlton U, if uh, we're open to more questions, or if not, if it's a tight schedule. Thank you very much, Sarah. Oh, and, hey, uh, it's Dean. I have Dean here. <laughs> Um, all four of you, a wonderful presentation, and we're so pleased that you're part of this. And especially, uh, Zara, we've had the pleasure of your involvement in uh, Naval Ottawa for several years. And uh, it's always great to see the, the great work that you're doing. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, the, the fact that Tetra continues to solve problems that major organizations can't solve. They're very individualized problems and uh, you do a wonderful job. So thank you so much.